Well, good evening, everybody. It is, uh, it is a new year, man, a new year. And, uh, man, we're going we're gonna to go places this year at Christ Church of the Valley that I believe that we've never been before. I honestly believe that. A lot of that has to do with the cause of our prayer meeting that started, and we're praying on our knees before God, so God always responds. And a lot of it is, too, is what God's been doing in my life. If you've been away for a few weeks and you're back and think, I think Pastor Jeff has lost some weight. You're right, probably about 14 pounds. And if you've been away, it's not because I wanted to. I've been through an illness, and I'm still kind of in it, fighting it. But God's teaching me things through it, too. And so right now, uh, we're in a new series. We're starting this year in the book of Jonah. So you can read the book of Jonah for the next five weeks. And we're going to take five messages out of that book. And the title of the sermon series is called Occupy Me. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this group called Occupy. Maybe some of you are. Well, let me give you the description, how they describe themselves as a movement. They say, we are a movement to protest social and economic inequality, high unemployment, and greed. And they say, we are the 99%. Uh, making reference to, they believe that 1% has all the money and makes all the rules. Now, I'm not here to either confirm or deny my participation in Occupy, of course. They just are a great example of where I want to go today. Because their strategy, consequential to what they say a description of their movement is, reads like this. They want to take up residence in key pivotal strategic places that our voices might be heard and the will of the people might prevail. And so again, you'll have a slogan and you'll see picketers with signs that say, we the people, based on the preamble of the U.S. Constitution. And if you've been following this movement called Occupy, they have taken up residency just about everywhere. Wall Street, City Hall, City Park, Central Park, and most recently, I don't know if you knew this, but they marched at the end of the Rose Parade. Did you know that? Now, I've been watching and listening to this movement. And they've intrigued me a little bit, because at least they're organized. But when I saw this guy holding this next sign, Occupy Everything. That's when I knew, man, this is a great example of where we want to go for this year because that's exactly what God wants. Now, let me go back to my favorite C.S. Lewis quote. He says, imagine yourself as a living house and God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right, stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. And you knew those jobs needed doing, so you're not surprised. But he goes on and he says, but presently... He starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he is building up a palace. And then he, he says, why? Because he intends to come and live in it himself. Now, this is the best explanation I can give you for what it means to move from here to there. Remember, we did this all last year, that most of us start here. Some of us remain there, unfortunately. This is where there's self-centeredness. It's all about us. It's all about egocentrism, what we want, our needs, our goals, our objectives. And God wants to move us from here, which is a horrible life, a defeating life, to there, where we gain direct access to his wisdom and his power and his knowledge in every facet of living. And he's intentional about moving us from here to there. The problem is, in order to do that, he's got to occupy us completely. Uh, go back to what we said, occupy strategic statement. They said, we want to take up residence in key political, pivotal places that our voices might be heard that the people and the voice of the people might prevail. For us, this is our occupy me. When God takes up residence in key, pivotal, strategic places of our lives, that his voice might be heard and his will might prevail in every area of our lives. To get us from here to there, he's got to occupy everything. And we've got to allow him to come in, in the words of the Apostle Paul, so it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us and through us. Now, here's the question. Who really wants to be there? I mean, who, who, don't raise your hand because I'm afraid if you do, others don't want to be there and it'll embarrass them. But that's where I want to be, man, where every day is a day where I'm operating in the wisdom of God. 
and I have direct access to the power of God to overcome any obstacle and do anything that the fear and the anxiety in my life might go away. It might dissipate. It'd be less of me and more of God. And that is the abundant life. But if that's where you want to be, there. Then the Bible says that there's obstacles that will deter you from the journey and get you off the path. And you've got to be familiar with them. That's why we're going to study the book of Jonah. Because in the book of Jonah, we find five obstacles. And rather than try to cover them all in one message, we're going to spread it out so that you can get out of church on time. So you're happy about that. So the first obstacle you find in the book of Jonah in chapter 1. Now go to Jonah. Here we are. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. And the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Jonah was a prophet, not a priest. Priests served in the temple. You know, they offered sacrifices. They were loving. They were encouraging. They were kind of like spiritual cheerleaders. They told you that you could do it. That's a priest. Jonah's a prophet. They're spiritual troublemakers. They're activists. They're spiritual picketers. These are the guys that hold signs out in your front lawn while you're sleeping that say repent or turn or burn or something like that. And they don't say you can do it. The prophets say you better do it. Now, Israel had many priests, but they only had one prophet at a time because that's all they could stand. And one day, the Bible says in the book of Jonah that the word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh. Now, before you're too hard on Jonah, you've got to understand what God's asking. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. The largest city in the world at that time, a population of over 600,000 people, and they had these magnificent walls, eight miles long that enveloped the inner city, and then beautiful, beautiful scenery that was kind of the circumference of some 60 miles around the outer parts. So Nineveh was not only large, it's not only big, but it was bad. They had one state policy and one policy only, and it was genocide. Kill everybody that you meet who is not an Assyrian. That was their political strategy. Annihilate and obliterate. And if you know anything about your Old Testament history, you'll know when the nation of Israel was divided in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the Assyrians marched on the northern kingdom and vaporized them, wiped them out of existence. As a matter of fact, I have in my notes here, there are some practices that the Assyrians participated in they're worse than any rated R movie you've ever seen. And in order to keep this sermon at least G or PG, we're not going to really go there right now. But we are going to tell you that it involved men, women, and children. They were ruthless. And because they were ruthless, the Assyrians had no allies. Now, Nahum is a prophet who's later going to write about the demise of the Assyrians. And he prophesies when the Assyrians are defeated. Well, here's what he says in Nahum 3.19. Everyone who hears the news about you, in other words, about your demise, will clap their hands. Now, we in Los Angeles understand that completely, don't we? It's what the Celtics did when they heard Kobe got injured. They stood and clapped their hands. Are Celtics fans really that bad? Absolutely. You ever been to Boston? It's, it's like Angel fans down in Anaheim when the Dodgers made the news that they might go bankrupt. I don't think that people in Anaheim were having fundraisers. They're probably saying... Perhaps an end of the Dodger blue. Are you with me? And I guarantee if the Angels don't win the division after acquiring C.J. Wilson and Albert Pujols, I promise you there will be Dodger fans laughing and standing with an ovation and saying, you punks down in Anaheim. Even if you got a ton of money, you still can't win. Now, I know I went too far with that. But <laughs> Nahum says this. Nahum says when the Assyrians fall... People will remember that those were the people who killed our children and enslaved our relatives and killed our family, and they will stand and give an ovation. Now, here's what I want you to notice. In Jonah 1, notice what Jonah is told to do by God. God doesn't say, Jonah, go and preach to the city of Nineveh. He says, I want you to go and preach against the city of Nineveh. Now, who likes that approach? Now, think about this. When I was growing up, we had the Vines family on this side, and there was a fence and a bunch of apple trees. And on the other side of the fence were the Oakley family. There were three boys in the Oakley family, four boys in the Vines family, and one girl in the Oakley family. Her name was Mary Beth. She was beautiful. She was my age. 
I tried my best to talk to Mary Beth. But you can understand after hearing the stories about the Vines family why her three brothers prevented that from ever happening. And so we'd just get angry at these boys because they were bigger, stronger, and older than we were. So we would shout things across the fence. We would say things like, hey, your mama's ugly. And, and, and you stink. And your daddy drinks moonshine. Now, I don't know why we said that last part. I'm not real sure. It felt good at the time. And I'm not sure how it was supposed to hurt. But it just felt right. You know, it felt right to say that. And then we'd pick up rotten apples that had fallen on our side of the fence. And we'd hurl them over like missiles to try to hit the Oakley boys. Oh, bring back those days. <laughs> the point is, it's one thing to do that on our side, but it'd be entirely different for me to cross the fence and do the same thing in their backyard. God, by the way, this is the only time in the New Testament that God asked a prophet to leave Israel and go into a foreign land in the middle of the streets and prophesy against them, preach against it. The best that could happen to Jonah, and he knew it, would be that they would throw some rotten eggs or tomatoes at him. More likely, though, they're going to torture him, incarcerate him, and ultimately kill him. So Jonah runs away. Because Nineveh wasn't in his comfort zone, man. I'm sure when Nineveh heard the word from God, he thinks, man, God is not thinking right. This just won't work. They'll kill me. God must be confused. So Jonah prefers his wisdom over God's. Now, how does Jonah respond? I want to show you a map. God says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach. Jonah goes to Joppa, catches a ship, and goes to Tarshish. Does anybody see a problem? <laughs> he goes in the exact opposite direction God calls him. And in doing so, he makes the mistake that thousands of young people make still today, middle-aged and old. And that is that you can directly disobey the call of God, go in the opposite direction, and nothing ill will happen to you. In fact, you can run from God when he asks you to do something hard and your life will actually get better. Can you believe that there once lived the people who believe such folly? Now, for you people who just have to have your bulletin outline, this weekend's for you. Because as we look at these obstacles, stop for a moment. If we're going to get there where we have the power and the wisdom of God, man, don't you want that? To see things the way God sees them. To see the world, to see your life, your relationships, your parents, your children, everything through the eyes of God. To be there where God occupies you. The first thing you got to do is admit that you have a natural tendency to run away from God. It's your natural bent, not to Him. You think about it for a moment. Everything Christ taught is countercultural. The world says, Hoard and stockpile, Jesus says, give it away. The world says, retaliate, Jesus says, forgive. The world says, it's all about egocentrism. It's all about you and your desires and you're worth it and what you're entitled to. Jesus says, you're entitled to nothing. Everything you have is by grace and your whole life is about theocentrism, about what God wants to do in your life. But ultimately, submitting to God gets you there, your very best life. Now, I don't think this is news to anybody in the room. You've been at a coffee place or standing around talking to friends and all of a sudden you felt this compelling inside you, a voice that says, hey, I want you to talk to this person. I want you to pray for them. The voice comes and you know it's clear as a bell, but you don't do it because you think, well, I got to get the target and get that last sale or I've got to go to the grocery store. I got to pick up the kids and something comes in your mind and you run from God. Sometimes God will tell you, hey, I know you don't have a lot of money, but this person has less. I want you to give them something. I want you to help them. You hear the voice, but you run away. God tells you to stop doing something in your life. It's clear as a bell. Do not do this anymore. And you just kind of ignore it. Or to start doing this. Get this habit in your life. You hear it. It's clear, but you run. Until you're honest with yourself and know that the best word that describes everybody in the room is fugitive, you'll never be able to move from here to there. Because the reality is, as painful as it might be, most of us in the room respect God. We do. But we live independently from Him. You respect the church. You respect the Bible. You respect the teaching. You respect the holy house. But when you're gone, you live the way you want to live. And when God calls, seldom do you respond. My grandmother, 
died two days ago. So I've had, a, I've had a pretty good year, haven't I? And I remember my grandmother. I was away at college. I came back to visit. And my grandmother said, can we sit down and talk for a while? I said, sure. So we sat down. We began to talk. And she said, Jeff, why haven't you been to see me in a long time? You know, and I just want to remind some of you, if you have grandparents, go see them, man. They get lonely. I said, well, Grandma, you know, I've been really busy. I'm in school now, and i got a job, and I'm busy. My grandmother looked at me. She pointed her finger. you got to know that old southern grandmother. And she said, young Jeffrey, if I know anything at all, these 70-plus years have taught me that every person on the face of the earth does exactly what they want to do. And it was her way of saying, if you really wanted to see me, you'd see me. When it comes to the voice of God, the reality is you have to admit. You have to admit that the word that best describes you is fugitive. You are a runner from God, especially when he asks you to do something hard. Now, here's the second key. We must become familiar with the particular strategies we use to run from God. The reality is there are patterns in our lives. I could go back and look at your life from day one. There are default paths that you take when God speaks. Now, there's something interesting in this passage. The Bible says that Jonah went down and he paid the fare. I looked at that numerous times. He paid the fare, bought the ticket to board the ship. Now, here's what's interesting. We are living in a time in the Hebrews when they didn't work in coinage or money. It was on the barter system. My dad used to brag about this all the time. About when he was a kid, he would take five boiled eggs and take them to Joe Smith Dills, a supermarket, and he would trade that for a bologna sandwich and a bottle of Coke. It was the barter system. So somehow Jonah gets hold of money. The point I believe that is made here is that the more wealthy you are, the more means you have to run from God. And in an affluent society, when God starts to speak, and it's hard, his call is difficult, we can get busy with recreation, we can play golf, we can go to the gym, we can go shopping, we can go to the restaurants, we can work more hours, we can watch more TV, and we can drown out the voice of God. So we don't have to deal with him. The more wealthy you are, the more ways there are to ignore God. But I don't want to talk about that aspect. What I want to talk about is three others. I think for a lot of us, we have a justification pattern. Rather, let's start with this, let's start with this one. We have a self-righteous pattern. The Spirit of the Lord comes in and convicts us to forgive someone. Now, you know, when I was in New Zealand, we had a friend who had a co-worker that had done something really horrible. I can't remember what it was. But my friend in our accountability group was so upset you know, he just sat around all the time dreaming about revenge. Now, you know that's fun, isn't it? Come on, be honest. For a while, it is. For a while, it's fun to think about how you're going to get back at this person. And you're in the shower, you know, you're just taking a shower, and you're thinking, boy, I could do this, or I could do that, and I could do that. And it's just like, wow. But after a while, you become a bitter person, and you start poisoning everybody around you. So we confronted him, and we said to him, hey, man, you need to just forgive this person. Or it's going gonna, it's gonna to drive you crazy, and you're going to drive us crazy, and it's going to spread this poison everywhere. Never forget his response. He said, well, I thought about that, Jeff. But then I remembered, I know the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But I think God wants to use me as his instrument of wrath. <laughs> I'm dead serious. And he kept saying, I am on a message, I am on a mission from God. And I kept thinking about the Blues Brothers, because all through the movie, I'm on a mission from God. A mission from God. He really thought, that it was his job to be God's representative to wreak havoc on this person. Some of us, when we're convicted, we have a justification pattern. I walked in on a friend of mine in Bible college and seminary who was watching something he shouldn't have been watching. Yes, that happens in Bible college and seminary too. And I said, dude, what are you doing? Well, I didn't say dude. This was before dudes. So it was probably, man, what are you watching? And he said, well, I, I was just thinking that if God really wants me to go out into the world and preach the gospel, i got to know what I'm dealing with, so I'm just doing some research. <laughs> and I hope that none of you in the room are looking at things like pornography and thinking, well, Pastor Jeff says that we need to walk across the room, so if I'm going to do that, I need to investigate and be aware of what I'm dealing with when I get out in the world. But I think for most of us, when the conviction and the word of the Lord comes, it's more of a grace abuse issue. Now, stay with me. You're in church one weekend. The Spirit of God speaks to you about some area in your life, some change you need to make, some place you need to go. 
Or maybe as an example, all of a sudden it dawns on you, wow, God does really own me. It is about him and his kingdom. And he wants me to use my gifts and talents and abilities for his purposes. Wow, I can't believe this is true. And one day in the church, you just start talking to yourself, man, God is the giver of all good gifts. And if I really want God to bless me, for instance, financially, how could I ask him to bless me financially when I keep back a portion of what rightfully belongs to him? This makes no sense at all. How could I give God what's left over when he gives me his very best? And all of a sudden it dawns on you, you've got to make a change. But then you know what you do? You play the grace card. Oh, but wait a minute. Pastor Jeff says I'm saved by grace. That God will forgive me whatever I do. And Jesus' blood will cover me. And you say, oh, it's okay. God loves me no matter what. Now, you know what? You're right. God does love you. Can I read you another passage about love? Out of Hebrews chapter 12. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So the next question is, how does God deal with Jonah's running? And we find it in Jonah 1 verse 4, then the Lord sent a violent storm, a violent wind on the sea. Two interesting Hebrew words here. When I played peewee baseball, uh, I, you know, it's not hard to do this, but in peewee baseball, I threw a no-hitter as a pitcher. Now, that's not hard to do. And my mom was so impressed, she cut the clipping out of the newspaper, and she put it in a little book. And I would go to that book and read it every day because I love the words. Vines hurls a no-hitter. I didn't even actually know what, know what hurled meant, but I knew it was a good thing. Now, today it means quite a few things. But in the Bible, it means this. It means to gather up and throw down. And the reason I say that is because it is clear from the Bible that God sent the storm that he gathered up the storm clouds and threw down on Jonah. The storm was so violent, according to verse 5, that the ship threatened to break up, that the sailors were all afraid. Every man began to cry out to his God, and they began to throw the cargo overboard. Now, that's crucial. Crucial, man. I wish I had time to develop this thought and what happens at Joppa. We're at a time where if you can captain a ship and get all the goods from point A to point B, you would make enough money if all the goods arrived safely to be set for the rest of your life because you're going to face peril on the sea. So here these guys have the opportunity. We're talking about a short lifespan. Here's their one chance to make it. And guess what? The storm is so bad, they do two things. Number one, they throw everything overboard because there's no use being rich when you're dead. And then each man prays to his own God. Now, remember, this is not monotheism. This is a pluralistic culture here. Every man prays to his own village god or his own tribal god, hoping that somebody has one of the gods that, who is the god over the sea, and the sea will be calmed. Now, if you're familiar with the story, you know the next part. What's Jonah doing? The guy is sleeping. Now, I'm sorry, but I love the King James Version here. Because the captain is stunned when he finds out Jonah's asleep and he goes down and in the King James Version he says, what meanest thou, O sleeper? Don't you love that? Okay, I did, so fooey on you. <laughs> what meanest thou, O sleeper? He said, how can you sleep at a time like this, man? Get up like the rest of us and pray to your God. Which means the pagans are doing what the prophets do. Here's the irony. They're calling on the men to God, of God to pray. And the prophet is doing what the pagans do. He's sleeping well, he should be praying, which leads me to the third one. We must realize that the effects from running from God are seldom immediate. Young people, I want you to hear me on this. At first, when Jonah runs from God, he doesn't feel anything. He's pretty much at peace. I mean, he's sleeping while there is a violent storm. Running from God is not like a cannonball. It's not like God says, oh, there's another runner, light the fuse. <laughs> Boom! Pew, and explodes and you're done. Now, if God operated like that, there would be no people left. <laughs> He's much more kind and gracious and merciful. Running from God is more like the effects of smoking. Now, I'm not here to preach against smoking tonight. I'm not here to tell you it's a sin. I'm here to tell you, because I love you, to stop because I saw what it did to my father for 40 years, and the end is not going to be well for you. Because cigarette smoke gets into your body, 
And even if you never get cancer, it gets into the pores of your skin. Your face changes. Your skin changes. You stink, but you're the only one who doesn't know that. And you think you can step outside and have half of one come back in and nobody will notice. But it's in your clothes, and it's in your hair, and it's in everything. And it's in your blood, and it gets in your lungs. And finally, you get to the time in older age where even when you can get enough air in, you can't blow enough out to take another breath. So you go on oxygen, and you live like that for a year or two, and then the end is horrible. Running from God is more like that, where you slip away, and you keep running, and you keep running, and you think everything's fine for a while. And then one day, and you guys who are into Westerns will appreciate this, you realize that a posse's been on your trail all along. It's kind of like this bungee cord here. You know, if, I, if I'm with God and I start running from God in the opposite direction, for a while I got slack. I don't feel anything at all. I'm cool. It's all good. And then I move a little bit further and I realize, well, something's not quite right, but I don't know what it is. And then you get to a point where you are a wreck psychologically. The problem is you're restricted. There can be no future progress. You can't move forward anymore, but you don't know why. Because you're so far from God that you can't see the light anymore. It kills you slowly. It robs you of vitality slowly, of life slowly. The minute you get off path, the minute that starts happening, the longer you stay away from God. And the more you run the more God convicts. And the more you run, the more he convicts even more. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself a psychological, spiritually depleted. And you'll feel physically tired, but you won't be able to know what it is. You'll just know something is not right. Think about it. Revenge, again, is great at first. It really is. Anybody who's thought about how to get back at somebody who hurt you, it's fun at first, and then it becomes a prison of bitterness. And then it affects all aspects of your body. Sexual immorality feels great at first. Come on, let's be honest. It does. At first, it feels great. Then there's broken lives and broken families and broken trusts. Folks, it catches up with you. You can only run from God so long until everything starts to fall out from underneath you. Jonah is awake now in the story. And according to the Bible, they cast lots to get an indication of the source of trouble. Now, this is an Old Testament practice. It's kind of like rolling the dice. Everybody has a number. If your number comes up, you're the cause of the problem. For some reason, God allowed this. So they roll the dice or spin the bottle, however you want, and it points right to Jonah. Now, if you're Jonah, you're thinking, my goodness, can't I get away from God anywhere I go? And then something happens. Jonah starts to turn. And I, I say we shouldn't be so difficult on Jonah because it would have taken a lot more than a storm to turn most of us. But Jonah then says something. He says to the men in the boat, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now I want to show you something here. And doggone it, this year we're going to learn some things. We've got to take deep breaths and learn a little bit about the Bible. Now here's the thing. When you read the Old Testament, you'll find the word God and the word Lord. And sometimes... Uh, it'll be one word, and other times it'll be another. For instance, we have the word Elohim. That's a generic term for God, the God of Israel, the God of the tribes. Other times when you read the word Lord or God in the Bible, it'll be from Adonai, which is Lord or Master. Don't get too carried away with Adonai because it's also used in human relationships. Sarah called Abraham, her husband, my Lord, my Master. It's the Hebrew equivalent to the Greek kurios, Lord, Master, Teacher. Every morning before I leave the house, my family, my wife and kids gather at the front door and they wait till I come out and they say, our Lord and our master, what would you have us do today? <laughs> and I know that if you have teenagers in your home, it happens the same way. And so that's Adonai. But then we come to this word, which nobody knows really how to pronounce because this is the name of God. Now we put the vowels in and we say Yahweh, but it's a sacred name, not a title. It's the name of God. It's the name God uses when Moses said, who do you want me to say is sending me? And God says, you tell them, I am who I am. Now, I know that sounds like a line right out of Popeye, but it's not. <laughs> Yahweh, I am who I am. It's never pronounced for fear of abuse 
by Jewish scholars. And even still today, if you're in the synagogue, when the Jewish reader comes to Yahweh, they will say Adonai instead out of respect for the name of God. And then when you come to a word in the Old Testament, Jehovah, Jehovah is just where you insert the vowels of Adonai into this word and it becomes Yehovah. The point I'm making is this. When you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in the Bible, it's Yahweh. It is the name of God. And Jonah speaks up after he's identified as the troublemaker. And he says to his friends, I'm not just running from a God, the God of the sea or the water or the fish or the boat. I'm running from the God, the God who sends storms into the lives of people who run from him. What was I thinking? God can be trusted. Now, stay with me. Round third. Four, we got to understand that running from God is always a trust issue. Now look up while I build this point and we finish this together. If you're into apologetics and you love debating, you like the intellectual side of the gospel, it has that side. Then you know in your discussions with unchurched people or people who are not Christians, and I hope you have these discussions in love, then you'll know that there's a lot in the Bible and a lot about Jesus that our unchurched friends love. They love that Jesus talked about forgiveness, especially if it's concerning the Middle East. Now, they may not do it in their own lives, but they still like the idea of forgiveness. They love Jesus' compassion for the poor. They love that it appears that Jesus was all about social justice. They love that Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. But then you start talking about no sex before marriage and monogamous relationships and restrictions on what you look at and how you speak and what you do and how you live. And all of a sudden the guard grows up and they don't want to listen. But it's only because they've not yet discovered that the God of the Bible is a God of great love who treats us like his children, who gives us parameters in which we are to live. And if we live within those parameters, we'll be safe. And God will be with us. And the wisdom and power of God will be on us. He's a loving God. Now I want you to consider two examples, two distinctions quickly. Abraham. Abraham's told he's going to get a son. He has to wait over two decades before Isaac comes. And then what does God do? God asks Abraham to take him up the top of the mountain and sacrifice him. Now that had to confuse Abraham. What's interesting, though, if you read that passage, Abraham knew that God would never go through with it because he says to his servant at the bottom of the mountain, wait here, Isaac and I will be right back. He goes on top of the mountain. He's probably smiling all the way up because he takes refuge in God and he knows God is trustworthy. He takes the knife back. The angel of the Lord stops him. And then he says later, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham took refuge in God. Jonah was asked to do something hard, and he took refuge in himself, in his own wisdom and his own way. And because he did that, the storm clouds began to gather. And the reality is when you and I hear the voice of God, whatever it says, you can take Abraham's way, and you can say, this is risky. God, this seems hard. But you know what? How dare I disobey you? I'm going to take refuge in you that you are trustworthy. I will obey. Or you can take Jonah's way and say, I'll take refuge in myself, in my way, and I'll board a ship going in the opposite direction, and I can guarantee it it won't be long before the storm comes. All right, just quickly, let's finish the story and make the last point. Jonah is waking up to that truth. Now, stay in the story with me, okay, because this is my favorite part. The sailors know the storm is getting stronger and stronger, and they look at each other and say, what are we going to do? This guy's a troublemaker, but what are we going to do? They have more compassion for Jonah than Jonah did for the Ninevites. Because Jonah then speaks up and says, I know what you got to do. And this is amazing to me. He says, what? Throw me overboard. Now, it's a bit drastic, and at first I think, man, really? But then you got to understand where Jonah's coming from. He's saying, I'm tired of running from God. I'm going to face this storm. Maybe if they throw me into the center of the storm, which is where God is, then I'll be more safe there than running from God, and he's right. By the way, I said earlier that it is our natural tendency to be a fugitive and to run from God in every situation. That's not really true. There is one situation where we always run to God. When is it? When we're in big trouble. 
No, then we want to run to God. And so Jonah runs to God, and he does that by telling the men on the boat to throw him in the middle of the storm. The sailors, however, these pagans don't want to do it. So they try to row the boat. They try to get it to shore to no avail. And then this is what they say in verse 14. Please, Lord. Now notice that they use Yahweh. Do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. As At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered sacrifices to the Lord and made vows to him. Now, I've got a little note in my margin. Do you know what it says? God's going to use you one way or the other. You won't go to Nineveh and preach the gospel? Fine, I'll put you on a boat going the other way to a bunch of pagans, and those guys are going to come to me when they see how I discipline my own. They were so impressed that the God of Israel would actually discipline Jonah that when they threw Jonah in and everything calmed down, they said, this is the real God. God's going to use you as a good or bad example. Either way, he's going to use you. Now, the Bible says they throw Jonah overboard and immediately all is calm. And before I give you the last point and we're finished, let me give you a summary of verses 1 through 10 of Jonah 1. It goes like this. Verse 1, God says go, Jonah says no, God says blow, Jonah says so, captain says bro, Jonah says throw, sailors say whoa. That's free of charge, no cost. Now, so to end our time, there's one question for everybody. In what area of your life are you running from God? What does God ask you to do you're not doing? Where does he ask you to go you're not going? What does he ask you to get rid of that you've not gotten rid of? What relationship has he asked you to end but you haven't? When I used to visit my grandfather, he had these. These are my very favorite thing. I love ice cream sandwiches. Back in the, in the East, we had Mayfield ice cream sandwiches. I've not seen them here, but they're beautiful things. They are, the ice cream sandwiches, for me, is how I know as an apologist that God does exist. <laughs> and so, we would go to grandfather's house, and they had this little room in the middle of the house with a refrigerator, not one standing, but it was horizontal, and you would open the lid, and as soon as we got to grandfather's house, he would take us in the little room, and he would make his precepts clear. One ice cream sandwich per person. But ice cream sandwiches are like potato chips. You cannot eat just one. And so after the rest of my brothers had gone out into the backyard to play wiffle ball, I would sneak back in and I'd help myself to another one. Sometimes another one. This went on for a couple of months and my grandfather caught wind and he wasn't very happy. So he started counting the ice cream sandwiches. He would open the box and count how many are there when we arrived. He would count them again when we left or right before we left to hold me accountable. So I had to come up with a new plan, and I did. <laughs> I discovered that the way ice cream sandwiches are made, that you can actually remove them from the package very slowly. And then you can blow back into the package, and you can put it back into the box, and it appears that it's still there. <laughs> and as I've said before, yes, that young boy was going to grow up and become your senior pastor. Now, I did this for, I guess, three months. Now, that's a lot of extra ice cream sandwiches. And then I got caught. And then my grandfather would sit in a rocking chair by the door of the middle room. And for about an hour, because he knew after a while I'd give up. And I did. Now, I was young, though. Remember, I'm really young. I mean, the criminal mind at such a young age... <laughs> And I started coming into the room, and I'm a little guy. And I'd say to my grandfather, hey, granddad, don't look at me. <laughs> now, why would I say that? Because I could go into the little room, get an ice cream. Don't look at me, granddad. <laughs> I believe that's exactly what so many of us do with God. God has called you to marital faithfulness. Don't look at me, God. God has called you to sexual purity. Don't look at me, God. God has called you to faithfully tithe your income. Don't look at me, God. 
God has called you to slow down and commune with him. Don't look at me, God. For those of you who have been praying for me, keep doing it. I'm not out of the woods yet. But I know why I'm in this situation. I've asked God to reveal it, and I know why. For 20 years, God has been trying to slow me down so that I would commune with him and trust in his power and wisdom in me to get me there and not in my own gift or my own resources. And I really and truly believe the only way that God could get me there is by causing something or allowing something to where the only measure I would have would be to sit before him and beg for this to end. For 20 years, I think I said to God, don't look at me, God. But in this area, I'm not saying it anymore. I have others, others, and I'm still not there. But I believe God has called many of you to slow down and to commune. And I hope he doesn't have to send you a storm. God has called some of you to sell it all, trust him, and go to Africa. God has called some of you young people to stop pursuing the almighty dollar. Stop pursuing some career in business to give it all up. Go to Africa. Become a teacher. Become a doctor. Become a nurse. It's hard, but you know down deep inside the calling is there. And everything within you wants to run. Don't do it. Run to God. Embrace him. Don't try to figure out all the details. Trust him. Take one step at a time. Follow his lead. And he'll get you there. And you'll wake up to the best life you never thought you could have. For some of you, he says, sell your business. Go back to school. Forgive your spouse. Give. Come out of retirement, man. Get out of the stands and back on the playing field in the kingdom of God. But for so many of us, we keep saying, don't look at me, God. Which is why the last point is the most crucial. We must understand the passion with which God pursues all fugitives. Sometimes now when people ask me to pray for their unchurched friends, I hesitate a little. Because I started seeing a pattern in my life. When people would say, Pastor Jeff, would you pray for my brother or would you pray for my cousin who doesn't know the Lord? I would pray for a while and I would ask them later how it's going. They say, you know, his life's falling apart. In a way, though, that makes sense, does it? Yes. How do you get a person off his own self-centeredness, his own self-aggrandizement, the pursuit of money and everything else unless you strip all of that underneath him where he can depend on nothing else other than God. But make no mistake, he doesn't just do that with people who are far from him in salvation. He also does it with people who are here, saved, get here, and get off the path. Then the storm will come until you get back on the path. So ultimately, he can get you from here to there. Because let me tell you something about the Bible. It says whether you are committed or not, God is committed to getting you there. He's going to get you there. Oh, yeah. You're going to get there. He says in Philippians 1, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So you're going to get there one way or the other. Which leads me to believe that the only thing greater than our tendency to run from God is God's passion to catch us. And if you're in a storm, it could be from God. Tim Keller, and by the way, go back to you young people, anything you can get your hands on that he's written, read it. Read it. He's the Ravi Zacharias of our day. And he tells a story, it's a fairy tale about a witch, and I'm ending with this is the end, truly the end. He says there's a witch who has an inn, and she has a soft bed, uh, for strangers who are traveling, wayfaring strangers, the fairy tale says. And if you're worn out, tired, you can take refuge in her inn on this soft bed. The problem is that if you're still asleep in the bed, when the sun comes up, you turn to stone. And it's a horrible kind of turning to stone, if there is a good kind. <laughs> Internally, everything is well, so your mind is there, your thinking, your activity, your sense of volition is there. It's just that the outside does not respond. It is turned to stone, and she forms this statuary of stone figures. One day, a little boy happens by the end. He's tired, he's sleepy, she offers the bed. There is a young servant girl who feels sorry for the little boy. So all night, while he's trying to sleep, she throws sticks and stones and thorns at him. All night! So he never gets any sleep. 
The next morning, he just kind of looks at her with such disdain. Because, you know, when you don't get a lot of sleep, you're cranky. Some of you are cranky anyway, but if you don't get sleep, you're cranky. So he looks at her, and finally, when she can't hold it back any longer, she responds by saying, young man, the misery you know now cannot compare with the misery your comfort would have brought. And then she says, these were stones of love. And God sent Jonah a storm, but it was because he loved him. And when we come back next week, we're going to go way down deep into that storm. And you know where he ends up. And don't say a well. A big, big fish. But for now, in what area are you running from God? Man, you've got you to come to terms with that. You cannot ever get there. Because some people will go here and they will run the rest of their lives. They'll be to the moon. But God doesn't let you go. You know, he still loves you no matter how far away you are. But he just keeps sending storms. And I think they grow with intensity until you get back on the road and obey what you know to be right and true. And if you will, just turn around. As soon as you just make any kind of turn, the Bible says that God is like the father in the story of the prodigal son. He will run out on the road to welcome you back. So come back home. Return to God. Stop running in whatever that area is. Turn around. Come back. Father, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for your love for us, how you do love us, and how you're so patient. And how oftentimes in our lives we start out with the little storms of discontent and frustration, not knowing for certain what's going on, why we feel the way we do. And then sometimes you allow the storms to intensify, to grow, in hopes that we would repent and turn to you. Father, we know that not every storm is because we are running from you. We know that. But we also know that it's a great question to ask. It is a great starting place. I thank you for revealing to me the purpose of this storm. Not a storm of correction, but maybe a storm of perfection so that we can get from here to there. And I pray for uh, this place right now, for your Holy Spirit to move in these few moments we have left and open our eyes that we may run to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, would you stand with me, please?